I'm gonna stand behind uh, the camera this time for right now instead of in front of it. Welcome back. Um, just to give you a nice clear view there of our starting board. So I didn't wanna to have to start writing that all together at one time. All right, so hello. Um, here we are back to our last 11.3 lecture. What did we do the last two times? Um, we talked about the integral test and P-series and um, how to determine convergence and divergence of series with these two new ideas. Well, P-series is just an application of the integral test, but now it's one of our super quick ways to talk about um, series tests, right? So we've got divergence tests, geometric series, now P-series as our fast ways to analyze something and then integral test if that guy doesn't work. Just gonna double check the camera one more time. I'm gun shy now. Um, okay, so um, here we go. So that, that's what we have been doing. And we said at this stage, right, we quit asking what is the sum of the series. We just, if it did converge, we just wanna know does it converge? Does it converge to something finite or does it grow without bound? Um, or not converge to something finite? And so, um, this time, right, what we're going to do is talk about bounding the error in an approximation to the sum of a series, okay? So what if we, um, we have an easy way, you can always easily approximate a series just by adding the sum of a series that's convergent, just by adding up, you know, the first however many terms, however, however far out you're willing to go, that's an approximation to that sum of that series. What are you missing? infinitely many terms that keep on going, right? So the question is, um, oh, and you'll see this too, at the end we're gonna prove the integral test. Um, the question is, can we say ahead of time, right, how many terms we need in the nth partial sum? How far out should we go, right, with Sn? Like how far out should n be 30,000? Should n be 50, right? How many terms do we need? so that we are guaranteed that just by adding up those first however many terms it is, um, that that finite sum, right, that you can get a computer to do in a second, um, for you 30,000 would be a little hard, um, but that finite sum, which is not difficult, whether it's a computer or you for a small number of, um, for a small number of terms, right, that's just adding up a bunch of things. How, how can we be guaranteed that that thing is within some error tolerance? Our favorite letter, right? Say epsilon. We need to be within epsilon of the actual answer. What's the actual answer? S, which is what the series converges to, but we don't know S, right? So here we go. If we don't know S, how can we guarantee that adding up the first however many terms, I'm within a particular error tolerance of the actual unknown guy. That's pretty powerful, right? Okay, to be able to say that ahead of time. So, let's talk about that. So that's where I'm gonna erase this now. Hopefully you had some time to write that all down, okay? So what we're gonna do is just, you know, basically write all of this again, but just much shorter, more mathy. Right? Okay. So, here we go. Oh. So let's do some, let's go back to the, the notation, right? Let's recall and establish some notation and terminology. So we have our series, right? This is notation terminology. We're gonna sum, we're gonna keep the counter as n because that's what your book does most of the time. So here's our infinite series, right? This means a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 blah 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 blah, right? One and one forever, right? Um, again, this is a shorthand notation. It's shorter to write n equals one to infinity. What do we mean when we stick an infinity up there? We really mean we're gonna take a limit um, of a finite sum, right? Um, and if I use the notation that your book uses, we're gonna change the counter here to k, 
right? Because k is going to run from 1 to n, so that'll be a1 plus a2 up through an, right? And then we're going to take, the, that's a finite sum, right? And then what do we do? We take the limit as n goes to infinity of our finite sum, right? Our finite sum will depend on n, right? So this is shorthand notation that means this. But then, right, this expression right here is a lot of stuff to write out. And so we give that a name. What is this guy called? Good. And what's its symbol? Yeah. S sub n, which is the what? Nth partial sum, right? The nth partial sum of our series, um, or our a sub n, right? This S n and this big summation are the exact same thing, right? We just shorten it up to give ourselves less writing, yeah? Okay, um, so this is what it means for a series, right? This, you should know this pretty well by now. And, um, and we say that if this uh, nth partial sum, if that limit is finite and it goes to some number s, then we call s the sum of this series, right? Okay, um, this is true if the series converges. Right? If the series converges, then this limit exists. It's equal to some number s, right? And that's what we call the sum of the series, summing the series. Okay, so um, let's now look at um, some other ways to split up thinking about this notation here, okay? Because remember, what's our goal now? It's We recognize that Unless you're a nice series like geometric or telescoping, it's super hard to actually find S a lot of times. Okay, so let's take our series, sum n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n, and split it up now um, into some, oops, we're going to switch to k. k equals 1 to n, our guy right here, our nth partial sum, right? This is our nth partial sum, right? Um, plus what? Well, if this is the sum of the first n terms, right, then what did I leave off if I want to sum infinitely many terms? If I want to keep a counter of a sub k, where will k start this time? So think about it like this. What if k were, what if n was like 5, right? So if I did the sum, here's an example. So I do the sum uh, n equals 1 to infinity, right, of a sub n. If that would be the sum as n equals 1 to say 5, let's say k, sorry, k equals 1 to 5 of a sub k plus what sum, right? That's our question. Right? Um, I would start counting here at what? Good. Six. To where? Good. Infinity. Right? This would be a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 plus a5. Right? That's what this is. a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 plus a5. Yeah? And then this would be plus a6 plus a7 plus forever. Right? Yeah? Well, we can do that in general for an n, so you guys tell me now what goes right here. Good. n plus 1, right? It's 1 more than n. Yeah? Because we've got the natural numbers going. And then what's up here? Yeah. So we could split that guy up that way. The nth partial sum plus the infinitely many terms remaining. Yeah? Well, that makes sense. The infinitely many terms remaining, right? That sounds um, like something that we ought to give a name to. Yeah? So. Again, if we have convergence, then this sum, n equals 1 to infinity, is just s, whatever the limit of it, as n goes to infinity of sn is, right? This guy, the nth partial sum, what's our short hand for writing that? sn, very nice. So it's probably worth giving this crazy sum, right, his own shorthand, yeah? That's sort of the deal here, right? And what did we just call that? We called that the remainder of the sum, right? So here we're using Sn 
Here's the first n terms, and then there's the remaining terms, right? The remaining terms after the first n terms. So we're going to call that guy r sub n, okay? Even though he starts counting it in plus 1, we're going to call him rn, just to keep these guys the same, okay? All right. So um, what do we have? Um, a nice little formula, right? That's what we have. What do we say we were going to start talking, thinking about, right? This guy is our approximation to S, right? S is our actual, right, uh, sum of the series, which we don't know. So what could I do with this equation to get some understanding of the difference between S, the actual sum, and Sn, the approximation. Oh, what word did we just use? The difference, right? So what if we subtract Sn from each side, right? So the difference, right? The difference between S and Sn is S minus Sn, right? And what is S minus Sn? Rn, yeah? Okay, um, so this guy is the remainder term, okay? Okay, our guy Rn, okay? And what does that do, right? Well, it tells us the difference between these two guys. It tells us how far off we are, especially if we think about it, think about it in absolute value terms, right? If I take the absolute value of both sides, right, if that's equal to that, then the absolute value of this is equal to the absolute value of that, right? Okay? And this is saying the distance between S and Sn, right, how far off you are, how far Sn is away from S, right? That's what that means, yeah? Some of our favorite absolute value notation, how far Sn is away from S um, is the absolute value of Rn. Right? Okay? So this guy is the error in using Sn to approximate S. Right? Okay? So now, um, what do we want to say? Um, okay. So the question then becomes, um, can we get a handle on how big that error is, right? Okay, so the question is, can we bound Rn, right? That's the question. Can we bound Rn so that we know just, you know, we can say, well, we have some error where, sure, it lives in this box. It's no bigger than this, okay, and using this approximation to this guy. Yeah? Okay? So that becomes our whole goal. Can we bound Rn, which tells us how far away our approximation can be from S. Yeah? Okay. So the question then becomes, what can we say to bound Rn? You ready? We're going to go do that now. That's our worst case scenario, right? What's the worst case scenario? Okay? Okay. And what's the problem, right, with Rn? Rn is itself an infinite sum, right? Okay. So, you know, we had written down this guy, right, to begin with, right? Um, what does this mean? This part means A1 plus A2 out to An. What does this mean, right? That's that plus. This is A n plus 1 plus a n plus 2 plus on and on and on forever, right? So the problem with trying to get a bound on our n is that it is itself an infinite sum, yeah? Okay? So we have to be clever, right? But we're up for it. There we go. So we plot in, I guess I should have circled this. We'll box this. the rest of this and then you can box this. So how did we start talking about the integral test to begin with, right? How, what did we do? What, were, what even gave us some insights into how we could um, even possibly use an integral 
to give us information on the series. How did we start off 11.3 when we actually started looking at some series that we couldn't say anything about so far? Good. We drew a picture, right? Okay. So let's recall the idea behind um, our integral test. Now, what were the hypotheses that we need, guys? There's three things that have to be true for the integral test to make any sense, right? For it to work. What were the three things? What are the three hypotheses? Good. F is good. Continuous, right? Um, for x greater than or equal to 1, yeah? F is good. Positive for x greater than or equal to 1, and F is good. Decreasing. For x greater than equal to 1, right? We got to have that. Okay. All right. And so if we draw a picture again, like we did before, okay, make this um, the n axis here and graph some of the n's. Um, and what do we know, right? The f is defined, right? A n defines f. And then when we actually do integration, we change into x. Okay, so when n is 1, right, I've got, you know, some dot. When n is 2, if f is continuous, positive, and decreasing, well, so positive and decreasing means I've got to be up here, right, and then I've got to be lower, right? Okay, yeah. Can't be down here. This guy can't be up there, right? We got it? Okay, and that goes on for forever, right? Okay, when n is 1, 2, 3, and 4, right? Okay, well, you know, maybe way out here, like maybe this is n, yeah? Okay, when I'm out there, you know, maybe I'm right there, yeah? A generic n. And then what would be the guy that comes before a generic n? It's, you know, minus 1, right? So that guy would be... What would be the guy that would come right after generic n? Good, and then plus one. Yeah, we good? Got the idea? Okay, all right. So that's our um, terms in our series that we are gonna add together. Um, and then now let's go ahead and just draw our, um, let's go ahead and just draw our curve that connects all these dots. In fact, actually, I'm going to just draw a few more. Oh, I guess I made this too small here. Um, I'm going to just get rid of that one. It's going to make my life simpler, right? And I'm going to put my dot, dot, dot sooner. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to make this better for myself. Sorry. Just so you can see it. It'll be better for you guys as well. Okay. So um, let's come out here then and be like, okay, well, here's some generic N. Too many colors in my hands. So here's my generic N. I'm going to put that dot there. So here's a generic N minus 1, right? So maybe that one's there, a little bit higher, yeah. And then there's N plus 1, right? It's there. And then we keep on going, right? N plus 2 there and N plus 3, yeah here, right, n plus 4, we get this, yeah, a little bit lower, yeah, does it make sense? Okay, good. Okay, so let's draw our f guy, right, so f is the continuous version of this, so we just put a curve through the dots, yeah, make sense, you okay? Here's F. All right, let's look at our guy Rn, okay? That's what we want to do. So recall, what was Rn? Well, it was the sum, K equals, you got it, N plus one to infinity, right? A base of K, which is, a sub n plus 1 plus a sub n plus 2 plus 
a seven plus three, on and on and on forever. Yes? Okay. Well, um, so let's try to set up some inequalities on Rn. Just like we did before, Rn can be thought of as um, a Riemann sum approximating particular integrals for f as either a left-hand sum or a right-hand sum, okay? So let's suppose we do a um, left-hand sum for our, so think, think of, let's think of this guy, um, yeah, let's think of this guy as a left-hand sum. So what would we have? I'm trying to figure out what colors to use here, okay? So if we use the left endpoint, right? If we use the left endpoint, so let's look here. Let's use the left endpoint as our height, and then our width is one for this rectangle, right? Then there's our first rectangle for the left-hand sum that would correspond to this guy, right? Because this value right, well, that would have an a sub n. Okay, <laughs> we're okay. Um, <laughs> Let's keep drawing for a sec. If, yeah, okay, let's just draw this next one. My, you can't see real well. Uh, probably should have made these bigger. All right, let's do this one more time. Sorry, I just want you to be able to see this. So let's pretend, let's pretend that we kind of did this down here and now let's just call this guy n, this one n plus one. Let's call this one n plus two, just so you can see better, right? n plus three, n plus four, and the rest keep going. n plus five, n plus six, n plus seven. We get it, yes? Okay, um, and so here's a dot, and there's a dot, and there's a dot, and there's a dot, and there's a dot. Yeah, is that, is that okay? Are we okay with that? All right. If we look at a left-hand sum, so let's keep going with our boxes here, hmm. our rectangles. These widths are all one, right? Left-hand sum, beginning to be able to see it a little bit better here. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Better? Can you see that a little bit better now? Okay, so we have our left-hand sums, yes? Okay. So Rn um, as a left-hand sum, well, what is this, right? This is a sub n, and this is a sub n plus 1, and this is a sub n plus 2, and this is a sub n plus 3, and this is a sub n plus 4, right? That's that height, yeah? Okay, does that make sense? Are we okay? Yeah? So if I look at Rn, which is a sub n plus 1 out through a sub n plus 3, then I'm really not including this box, right? Because I'm starting at a sub n plus 1 times 1 plus a sub n plus 1 times 1 plus a sub n plus 3, a sub n plus 2 times 1 plus a sub n plus 3 times 1, right? Okay, and this guy is my left-hand sum, and he's an overestimate, right? So Rn is an overestimate for what? Well, it's an overestimate for if I was computing the area under my green curve, right? Yeah, make sense? Okay. That, the red boxes are more than my area under my green curve. But what is that area? How do I represent that as an integral, right? It's as an integral, that integral is the integral from, where do I start? n plus one to where? Forever, right? Infinity of f of x dx, right? And this guy's an overestimate for this. So he's bigger than that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Okay. So now we've got something that that's bigger than, so we know the error is going to be bigger than this value. This is an improper integral, but we can do some improper, we can do improper integrals, right? But we really want to know an upper bound on this guy. We want to know what's bigger than that, right? And so, I guess I'll just go ahead and use blue. What is that going to be smaller than? Um, left-hand sum, it's an overestimate for this guy. Yes? Okay. So what if we look at this as a right-hand sum? Right? As a right-hand sum, let's do the right-hand sum in blue. Okay? As a right-hand sum, then I'm starting with my a sub n plus 1 term, right? And so then I've got a, I need a width of 1. It's a right-hand sum, so this is my rectangle. Yeah? And then for my a sub n plus 2, here's my width of 1 times a sub n plus 2. There's my second rectangle. My 1 times a sub n plus 3, there's my third rectangle. So as a right-hand sum, this is a what? Underestimate or overestimate? Good. It's an underestimate. 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 <laughs> there we go. It's an underestimate for what integral, right? Well, it's a right hand sum, right? And what area am I now approximating? Yeah, well, now it's going to be this area. Yeah? Okay, so where am I starting now? The integral from n to infinity of f of x dx. Yes? Does this make sense? Are we good? Okay. So here is an awesome inequality now that gives us an upper bound on Rn. So the error in using Sn, the difference between S and Sn, has got to be smaller than this improper integral, which is something we can compute. Right? That's super cool. Um, let's see. So this guy's going to be our go-to inequality. Um, and this piece right here, this piece, this side, right, um, gives us an upper bound on Rn, right? Okay. So how far away Sn is from S? has got to be smaller than the integral from n to infinity of f of x dx. Yeah. Okay. So let's, um, put one more inequality up here that's useful. This is the one we generally are going to use, right? So this is what's going to allow us to be able to predict ahead of time, right? So this will, so the fact that Rn has to be smaller than or equal to the integral from n to infinity of f of x dx allows us to predict ahead of time how many terms In the finite sum, Sn, we need, what is the number of terms? It's n, right? n is the number of terms. Allows us to predict n, right? I.e., n, how many terms of the finite sum we need to be uh, within an error tolerance. acceptable error tolerance. So we'll see an example of that in, in just a few minutes. But before we do that, let's just write down another inequality here. So we can just take this guy and just add um, Sn across the inequality, okay? So if we add Sn to each piece of the inequality, then we have Sn 
plus this is less than or equal to Sn plus Rn, which is less than or equal to Sn plus this. Right? That's legit. Legit inequality algebra. But what was Sn plus Rn? Back to the beginning, right? The nth partial shell in the sum of the first n terms plus the remaining terms. So this is just actually the entire infinite sum, right? This is your guy S, yeah? So this gives, us you, this gives you a bound on S, right? Um, so this is a lower bound on the actual sum, and that makes this guy N good upper bound on the actual sum. Right? And all of these things are computable, right? Sn is a finite sum. Finite sum. And these guys are improper integrals. So as long as you can actually integrate f, take those limits, then you can evaluate and get some numbers here to bound your s. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's go do um, the idea of our example, right? Important thing is this side's computable, that side's computable, gives you a nice bound on what your actual sum is. All right. So Um, let's remember what our original question said, right? Our original question um, asked about really the difference between S and SN, right? Okay? So we have S minus Sn was Rn, right? The actual sum minus the first n term sum is the remaining guy. And if we want, right, if we want S minus Sn to be less than some error tolerance epsilon, if we want that to be true, right, then if we force right, our n, right, to be less than epsilon, then that would give us what we needed, right? If we want that to be less than epsilon, well, what does that mean, right? Sorry. Then that means, then, then we want, that's the same as our n, then we want our n to be less than epsilon. If we want our n to be less than epsilon, and we know Rn is less than this, right? Um, so if we force this guy that we know is bigger than Rn to be less than epsilon, then what do we have? We want this to be true, right? We know that's true. We know that's true. These are the two things we know. We know this, and we know this, right? This is less than that, and that is less than that, and therefore, what law is it that tells us that this would then have to be true? If I know this and I know that, good, that's the transitive law, right? Okay, maybe this is just too messy for you to see it. So let's just get rid of all of that and state that one more time. So we know our n is less than or equal to the integral from n to infinity of f of x dx. And if we make the integral from n to infinity of f of x dx less than epsilon, then the transitive law gives Epsilon and Rn is less than epsilon. 
right? Which is what we needed. So let's look at an example of doing that. All my markers are going to dry out. Let's look at one of your homework problems. Um, let's look at number 40. Okay, you guys ready? Here we go. So, um, what does it even say? Um, it says, how many terms in the series? Let me just write it down here. So how many terms in the series the sum n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n times the natural log of n quantity squared Would you need to add to find its sum to with n zero point zero one? Okay, that's not very much, right? We're just asking the second decimal place. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the question, right? First of all, oh no, this guy starts at n equals two. Is everything we've said so far, right, no longer legit? No, right? Seems to doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, good. Tell me why can't we start this one at n equals one? What would be bad about that? Good. Natural log of one is? Zero. This guy would blow up, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't even be defined, right? So we have to start this guy at two because otherwise the first term isn't even defined. Yeah, makes sense. All right, good. Okay. So first of all, right? Um, before we can even think about using any of this stuff, right? We have to think about well, does this series converge, right? Okay. Um, and this guy is going to converge. You can kind of see it just by like walking through it now, right? It's not a p-series, right? It's, it's, it's close. Um, it's not a geometric series. Divergence theorem doesn't help you. Divergence test doesn't help you. Um, so integral test would be the test that you would use for this guy. And as you look at that, and if you think of the ends in terms of x's, make the ends x's, and think about integrating 2 to infinity, right? then you're immediately thinking, oh, let u be the natural log of n, or the natural log of x, then the u is 1 over x, and I've got my 1 over x sitting there, and this guy turns into a 1 over u squared integral, right? And 1 over u squared, right, that's going to be like a p uh, series integration of p, uh, the integral 1 over u to the p, um, and p is 2, and we know that those guys converge, right? Okay? Just gonna double check that we have filming continuing. Yes, yay, all right. Um, and so you kind of be, are beginning, you should be beginning to start to get some instinct into, all right, that guy's gonna converge without you even being told. You wanna be able to have that instinct. You also wanna be able to justify your instincts, right? Okay, so you would actually have to compute that with the integral test in order to show it. Um, we're gonna end up doing this computation anyway, which is kind of very similar. So. Um, but the question here is, you kind of told this guy converges, and now you want to know what should n be, right? How many terms, right? What is n? That's really what you're being asked. Okay? What should n be so that if I add up um, those, those terms, then I'm going to get, I'm going to be able to sum to within um, 0 0.01 of the actual answer, right? Okay? All right, so let's see what we would do, okay? What do we know, right? We know that what we want 
is our remainder term to be smaller than, what's our epsilon here, right? This is our epsilon. Epsilon is 0 0.01. But I'm not gonna put the number in right now just because it kind of just makes it uglier for no reason, right? So let's just do it for a general epsilon, right? Within some tolerance, epsilon, okay? So what do I do, right? I'm looking for um, this inequality here to hold, right? I know this guy is true. I want this one to be true. This is the one, the middleman I need to make happen, right? So if I make this happen, then that means that happens and I get that is less than that, yeah? So he's the middleman that I have to, requ I have to force to be true. So what does that mean? I mean, that means I need to integrate. I have to do this integration. What is the integral from n to infinity of f of x dx for this problem, right? Um, well, what does that mean? It means do the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from n to b of what is f of x for this problem? We just talked about it. 1 over x natural log of x quantity squared dx. Yes? Okay. Um, okay, so now what? Now we come over to the side and do the u substitution just like we said. Make it an improper integral, or sorry, an indefinite integral, and just look at this integration. Ignore the limits of integration. u is natural log of x. du is 1 over x dx. We're super happy, right? Because that means this integral with this substitution becomes the integral of, just like we said, 1 over x dx becomes du, right? And then we get 1 over u squared, right? And what do we have then? This integral, how do we integrate it, right? Um, we are now doing something different than when, if we would actually be trying to uh, um, evaluate whether or not this series converged from the integral test, right? Because our limit, this piece is the same, but our limit over here, our, our bottom limit is n, right? Versus it being two, okay? All right, anyway, um, how do I integrate this, right? That's the integral of u to the negative two to u. Add one to the exponent, right? Divide by the new exponent. Okay, rewrite that in a way that I like better seeing, minus one over u. All right, plus c, what was u? All right, there we go. Minus one over the natural log of x plus c. That was that guy, right? Okay, so back up to here, what do we have? Then this is the limit as b goes to infinity of what, it, what do I get from integrating this guy? We just did it down here. I only want this guy without the c, right? I only need the easiest antiderivative, minus one over natural log of x. Evaluate between what this time? n and b, right? n and b, yeah? Okay, so what does that mean I do? It's the limit as b goes to infinity of minus one over the natural log of, what do I put in first? Good, b minus, right? From fundamental theorem of calculus, then I got another minus, so that's gonna become a plus. Then what do I put in? n for x, one over the natural log of n. Yeah, we good here? Okay, so now I'm taking a limit as b goes to infinity. So here you gotta be super careful about your letters, right? And making sure of what you're doing, okay? And understanding how everything's working together. So if b is grown without bound, then the argument of natural log is grown without bound. We talk about this a lot of times. Where's natural log? What's the range of natural log? Goes off to infinity. Um, super slow, but it does. So this guy grows without bound. A constant over something growing without bound. That does what? Good. It goes to zero, right? This is the limit of a sum. This is the sum of the limits. Does anybody see a b in here? Are there any b's in there? No, no b's, right? B can go wherever it wants. This is a... Good. It's a constant, right? It's a constant as far as this limit is concerned, and therefore the limit of a constant is a constant. There is the result of that integration. Yes? All right.
Why did we do that? Well, it's because we wanted to force this to be true, right? We want the integral from n to infinity from of f of x dx to be less than epsilon, right? So the integral from n to infinity of our guy f of x dx is less than epsilon if what is true? 1 over the natural log of n is less than epsilon, right? What do we do with this? Because 1 over the natural log of n is what we just found that to be, yeah? Okay. Now I'm going to erase this. What do I do with this inequality then? What was my goal? What is in? Very similar to things we've done earlier in this semester, right? Solve this inequality for n. Yeah? Pause <laughs> PM. Thank you. Um, so, what should I do? Well, n is bigger than 2, right? So natural log of something two or greater, what do I know about natural log of two? It's positive, right? Because natural log of one is zero, yeah? And natural log is monotone increasing. And so I can multiply both sides by natural log, yeah? Um, epsilon is a positive number, right? It's an error tolerance, right? So that's positive. So I can multiply both sides by natural log of n and divide both sides by epsilon and not change the direction of the inequality, right? Because they're both positive. So if I, um, Divide by epsilon, I'm going to get a 1 over epsilon on this side. Multiply by natural log of n, I'm going to get that there. Yeah? What do I have left to do? Right? Um, how do I get the n out of inside of natural log? Good. Take the exponential both sides. Yeah? Okay, we'll write it here just to make sure you see it. Um, we can do that also because the exponential is monotone increasing as well. What is e to the natural log of n? Oh, beautiful. n, what does this say? n is greater than e to the 1 over epsilon, right? Here's our inequality, right, about n. So the nice thing about this is it's true for any error tolerance. If I change my mind and I wanted the error tolerance to be something other than 0 0.01, right, I don't have to redo all the calculations, yeah? I've already got a nice little formula, n as a function of epsilon, right? Okay. Um, and so this is our guy, all right? So for this problem, so for number 40, right? Now you can just plug in, right? Epsilon is 0.01. Um, we need n to be greater than, right? n is greater than e to the 1 over 0.01, right? Well, what is 0.01? 1 over 100, right? So 1 over that is e to the good, whoo! Anybody know what that number is? How many terms, this is telling us again, how many terms do we need to sum up in this series so that the sum will be within a meager, a meager 0 0.01 of the actual sum? How far do you have to go? You have to get 50 terms, 5,000 terms, Five million terms? Five billion terms? What is this number? This number is approximately 2.688. Lots of other stuff. Times, ready for it? 10 to the 43. 10 to the 43, what? <laughs> That's insane. That's a lot more than 5 billion, huh? Um, anyway, that's pretty crazy. You might not have predicted you would have needed that many um, just to get within 0 0.01, but the beauty of our nice little bound now allows us to know with confidence ahead of time what we need. That's kind of cool. Um, all right, there's some other problems like that in your web assign and your homework. Um, there's some other fun problems in there. Some of them are assigned for you for homework. If you look at problems 33 to 35, you'll see some recognizable names maybe in those um, exercises as well. Um, those are fun and interesting too, and super cool to think about how in the world people came up with um, some of the things they came up with at the time they came up with them. Anyway, um, but now we sadly have to stop not 
lecture. Um, stop continuing in this direction and just stop and prove the integral test, right? That's our goal now. We see all of this cool stuff coming from it, and now we want to um, be able to really have some confidence as to, as to why it works, okay? So I'm gonna erase the board now, and um, you can take a little mind breather. I'm gonna double check and make sure we're still videoing so I don't have the same problem that I had the last time. And then we'll do the last little piece that we have left in 11.3. Okay, let's take a look at video continuing, yay. All right, so here we go. Here's our um, proof of the integral test. Okay, so again, we have this nicely written up here for us. Um, again, we'll still go with our generic one, but again, it just needs to be wherever your sum is starting, okay? Um, okay, so let's see. Um, what do we wanna to try to prove, right? So let's prove that these are the hypotheses, right? Okay, prove that given the hypotheses, um, the, the way we use the integral test is to say that um, if I know the integral uh, converges, then I know the sum converges. And if we know the integral diverges, then, yeah. well, I'm kind of mixing notation, right? Then, if it implies, um, but it's okay. Uh, then we know that the sum diverges. Right? Okay? That's the way we utilize it, right? These are if and only if statements, really, but um, that's how it's easier for us to do an improper integral than analyze series. Okay, so let's look at the proof. Again, in order to think about the proof, we need, again, our visual, okay, that um, is super, super handy. Um, for us, so again, let's kind of do the same deal. And then we go on forever, right? And then somewhere down here, we have a generic n, okay? So generic n minus one is the guy that comes before n. Um, and we have, you know, like we said, a positive, right? The a sub n's are all positive, so they all live up here, right? They decrease, so the next guy is smaller than the previous guy, right? Um, and they, the function f that corresponds to it would be continuous, okay? All right, so we have that bit. Let's now look at the same kind of idea we did for the um, remainder guy, which is actually what I almost launched into at the very beginning, right? Why we had to sort of redraw um, our, um, our graph back with the remainders. So this time, right, what we want is an, a, um, inequality on the integral from 1 to n of f of x dx, okay? So let's see if we can um, think about that in the context of our um, Riemann sum approximations, left-hand sum and right-hand sums, yeah? So let's draw a curve down through here again. our f, right? And if we're thinking about this integral from 1 to n of f of x dx, okay, then we're here to here, right? To some specific n, right? This would keep going on though, right? You know, here's n plus 1, right? n plus 2, right? But we're just going to stop it there at n because that's finite, 
right? This is finite, okay? Yeah? And because this area has, is well defined here, right? That's a finite amount of area. Are we good? Okay, and that's represented by this integral, yeah? Okay, so um, what if we look for an upper bound, right? So what if we look for an upper bound, something that's bigger than this? Well, because of this decreasing nature, right? Because of the decreasing nature of the function f, which is going to be an upper bound, a left-hand sum or a right-hand sum? Good. The left-hand sum is going to be your upper bound, right? Oops, my dots are a little bit off. Move that two over to here. Yeah. Right? So my left-hand sum is going to be this, right? Yeah? This is a1, this is a2, this is, this is a3, right? That distance is a4, okay? That's my left-hand sum, my delta x's are all 1. And so what is that? I'm going to do left-hand sums the whole way out. My very last left-hand sum, my dots aren't on real well. There we go. Ah, whoops. Now we have blue dots on the carpet. Oh, no, that was black. Um, so, <laughs> right? The very last left-hand sum is going to be here, right? Yeah? And that's going to be an overestimate, right? An overestimate, overestimate for that integral from 1 to n. And so what is that sum? Well, I'm summing. I'm, I've got a1, a2, a3. What's my last one? a sub n minus 1. So I am summing from k equals 1 to n minus 1 a sub k, right? It's a, a sub k times 1 for the area of each rectangle, yeah? That's my overestimate, yeah? And then what's my underestimate? Maybe I'll try to use red, okay? That's going to be which sum? Which is going to be an underestimate? Because, again, of the decreasing nature, yeah? Um, the underestimate is going to be the right-hand sum, yeah? So what's my right-hand sum going to be, right? Here's my right-hand sum in red, yeah? That's my underestimate. Where's my last one? It's right here. What was my first one, right? My first one was a2, right, times 1. My second one is a3 times 1, right? A4 times 1. So where do I start counting for this one? This one is the sum. Maybe we'll start way over there. Start right here. The sum k equals 2, right, to n of a sub k. My last one has height a n and width 1. Yeah? All of these are finite. Finite, 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 right? All that just gets added up. Okay. Um, so, what is this expression? Well, um, this is just the nth partial sum, but without the term a1, right? The nth partial sum would be some k equals 1 to infinity. So this is the nth partial sum minus the a1 term, right? That's what this is the same as. Sn would be a1 plus that, yeah? Okay, so we've got our inequality almost pretty well set up. Let's just talk about what is this guy. This is the sum of the first how many terms? Starting at 1, ending where? Sn minus 1, very nice. And so therefore, this is what? It's a partial sum. Which one is it? How many terms are we adding up? The first n minus 1, yes? Okay, we good? Woohoo! So we've set up our inequality, yeah? All right, it's actually maybe a little bit simpler to do the divergence piece, okay? Um, so let's think about this um, expression. So this is the finite guy, right? Um, so, I guess I'm just going to go back to black. Oh, more black on the carpet. Um, so let's assume so since
this we know f is positive, right? This above the x-axis. The if we look at the this integral from one to infinity of f of x dx, where we take the area from here on out as well, right? Compare that to the size of the integral from one to n. Is it bigger or smaller? Right, it would be bigger, right? Because we've got more area, the function lives above the x-axis, so that's positive, right? So, um, so I don't know if you can do this thing, but we've got this guy, this truth, yes? Yeah, okay. All right, so that is bigger than that, yes? Okay. What is this? This is the limit, and then we go to infinity of the integral from 1 to b. Or, sorry, it's, well, yeah, 1 to n of f of x dx. Yes? Okay. So if this guy diverges, if this diverges, then what does that mean this happening to this limit? Well, since this is positive, right, that means this area is going off, growing without bound. Yes? Okay? So if this improper integral diverges, then this limit is growing without bound. And that guy is smaller than this guy. And so therefore, if the limit of this guy is growing without bound, then what is that going to mean about this guy? That's going to mean the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n minus 1 is going where? Also growing without bound, right? But what did we say once before, right? If n's going to infinity, where's n minus 1 going? Also to infinity. So what does that mean? That means the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n is going to infinity, right? And what does this mean? This means the sequence of partial sums diverges, and if the sequence of partial sums diverges, then the series diverges. Therefore, the sequence of partial sums um, diverges, which by definition says that the sum a sub n diverges. Yeah? Make sense? Okay? So that's the divergence piece. When the improper integral diverges, the series has to diverge. Now, what about the um, piece where the improper integral converges? Okay, so let's talk about that one. So here's our guy, right? And then we want to think about what happens if we're now thinking of this integral converging. Okay. So let's look at that part. I think I need to make myself a little more space. Does this make sense? Are we good? Okay. And I don't want to erase that part. We don't need this part anymore. Now let's look at this piece. This part of the inequality. So if I just add a1 to this side, Sn is a1 plus the sum k equals 2 to n of a sub k, right? Um, yeah. But that's less than or equal to if I add a1 to each piece, right? a1 plus the integral from 1 to n of f of x dx. Yes? Okay? Just adding a1 across. And this is just the sum k equals 1 to n of um, a sub k, which is the definition of sn. Okay, so what are we now assuming? Okay, so now we're saying, okay, what if we know that this guy converges, right? So, if this guy converges, integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx converges, right? Well, what does that mean? That means the limit, right, as n goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to n of f of x dx converges, right? I can point out the limits going to infinity. 
What does it mean for that limit to converge? It means it equals it's finite some number. We don't know what it is right now. It's L. We'll call it L, right? It has limit L, yeah? So this thing, if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of that piece, that guy goes to L. A1 is a constant, right? So L plus a constant is going to be smaller than some number M, which is an upper bound, right, on this expression. L is finite, right? L plus F, A1, right? It's going to be less than or equal. There's lots of upper bounds, okay? Um, so we've got an upper bound on this expression, but this expression is bigger than SN. What does that mean? Whoa, ho. So, um, the sequence Sn, the sequence of partial sums, right, is bounded above. Right? That, this is a number, and it's bigger than that. It's bounded above. Um, what else do we know? It's also bound to below, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, it's bounded to below by S1, right? It's the first term. Um, and it's also, why is it a no-brainer? What do we know about Sn, right? Um, is Sn increasing or decreasing? What do you think? S1, S A1, S2, A1 plus A2. S3, A1 plus A2 plus A3, right? Okay. What do we know about all the A's? They're positive. You keep adding something positive, right? So Sn is increasing, right? Okay. So the sequence of partial sums is increasing, right, and bounded above. What does that tell us? <gasps> Did I hear somebody say it? monotonic sequence theorem. Where do we see that? 11.1, right? What does the monotonic sequence theorem say? If I have a monotonic, i.e. increasing, sequence that is bounded, right? Bounded above matters here. Bounded below is obvious. Yeah? What do you know? Bounded monotonic Sequences, monot monotonic sequences converge. So there we have it. Therefore, Sn converges. And that is the definition of what it means for An to converge, right? Because An, what does this mean? It just means the limit then goes to infinity of Sn, where Sn is the nth partial sum. Oh, and there we have it, right? Sn converges, which means the sum A sub n converges. And we've come full circle back to down what it actually means. Pulled in our 11.1 result. And now we can rest assured that when we use the integral test, and we kind of saw where these guys came into, um, where these guys were needed, right? We need continuity because we need to be able to integrate. Positive was important, right? We see that for increasing. We saw that with the um, decreasing, with the divergence piece when we set up our inequality on um, our integrals, if we got the rest of the integral. And um, decreasing was critically important to establishing our inequalities, right, with a left-hand sum and a right-hand sum, okay? And there we have it. Now you know that with confidence that if you compute this integral, improper integral, and it converges, then the corresponding series also converges. I'll see you very soon for section 11.4. Have a good evening.